Pentecost in a few weeks' time, or at least our commemoration of it. Let's pray first. Our Father, we ask that your Spirit will help us now, that you might speak to us, encourage us, give us ears to hear. We ask that you will minister to us this morning, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now there's an interesting verse in Acts chapter 8, verse 3. Saul began to destroy the church. At least that's this version of it. A dramatic statement. Saul began to destroy the church. And we're going to look a little bit about the, some of the effects of that attempted destruction this morning and indeed next week. But nowadays, we don't really have a Saul. We've had a few attempts at it, like uh, Christopher Dawkins. Was his, is that his name? Richard Dawkins. Thank you. Some of you are keeping up on your readings. Uh, not quite as successful as Saul. Well, actually, none of them are really successful. The trouble with the modern church, of course, is that it's being destroyed from the inside. Ros drew my attention to an article in the latest Eternity. Did you all get Eternity? There are some there. And what I'd like you to do is to get your copy on page 11 and have a look at page 11 and read it and see whether there's anything here we ought to do anything about. Because it, uh, it reminds us of something that the Anglicans have known for some time, that while the Western church is in decline, the church everywhere else is growing. The churches of the majority world have seen extraordinary and sustained growth for decades, according to this article. Places such as Africa, Asia, Latin America, Oceania, the Caribbean, the Middle East, Eastern Europe, First Nations, the church is growing. In Christianity in Africa, Asia and Latin America grew from 94 million people at the beginning of the 20th century in 1900, 94 million. In 2010, they estimate 1.3 billion people are now Christians and it will be soon the case that China will have the more Christians in that country than anywhere else in the world. Why is this? Well, this particular article suggests some reasons. I want you to read them uh, in your copy of Eternity. For example, growing churches emphasize mission and evangelism. Renewed churches emphasize the Holy Spirit and renewal. What the West calls Pentecostal, the rest of the church calls Christianity. Spiritual churches emphasize prayer and community, and so on. There's a dozen of them, worth reading and having a look at. Well, I want us to look at Acts, because Acts will also give us a few clues as to what we might be doing in the face of the decline of the Western church, indeed the church in Perth, the Anglican church in Perth, is an example of the declining church. What can we do about it? What are the clues? Well, apart from what's written in that article, there are some really good clues here in the Acts of the Apostles. In the first few chapters of Acts, the tension has increased between the new disciples, the apostles, and the leaders of their nation, the Jewish leaders. In chapters 3 and 4 of Acts, after the lame man has been healed, uh, Peter and John get into trouble as a huge crowd gathers. The Sanhedrin warns them off. In chapter 5, the apostles are imprisoned, but uh, warned off, but miraculously released from prison in the night, and they go back to the temple preaching the gospel. Uh, the whole thing comes to a head with the story of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And following Peter, Stephen's death, there's this big persecution led by Saul, who's there when Stephen is killed. And when we get to chapter 9, of course, there's this wonderful description of what Saul is doing uh, when he's going off to Damascus. There is Saul breathing out threats and murder, murderous threats, according to this version that I'm reading. And so the result is, chapter 8, verse 1 of Acts, there's this big persecution, and all of them are scattered. Now, there's thousands of them, aren't there? There were 3,000 come to believe in the Lord on the day of Pentecost, and after that, more thousands. And all of them stayed in Jerusalem, of course. Some were just travellers or visiting for a festival. They'd have gone home already. But there's still thousands of people who are believers in Jerusalem who are now scattered out of Jerusalem. 
except, do you notice this in the first couple of verses of chapter 8? Except the apostles. So the apostles stay there and everyone else is scattered away. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Well, it's a good thing in this respect because if you go back to chapter 8, chapter 1, verse 8, when Jesus talks to the, the, the disciples, he says, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So this is actually the crossing of the first frontier into the next group that Jesus said they would be witnesses. Here is them moving across into Samaria. Now, this is an interesting plan, don't you think? Whose plan was this? Was this the apostles' plan? Did they say, let's send out missionary teams to Samaria? No, they didn't do that. Was this the plan of the Sanhedrin? Well, the Sanhedrin didn't think ahead, did they? Because now they've scattered what they would regard as wheat, or uh, uh, what are they, weeds, weeds everywhere. It wasn't the Sanhedrin's plan, really. It was God's plan, wasn't it? This was God's plan. Very interesting, I think. Do you think that they were safer now? Persecution, putting in prison, men and women imprisoned by Saul and his mates. Are they safer now when they're out there, out of Jerusalem? You don't think so? It's interesting. Actually, while you're reading Eternity, get to page 8. Because there's a really interesting article by a former missionary in Nepal, Naomi Reed. Some of you will have read some of her books she's at a conference in Singapore she said and the, and the leader of the conference in Singapore is very concerned that Singapore churches are large prosperous uh, have got a good status in their area they can easily travel but they're very concerned about being safe is it safe to be a Christian is it safe to go and bring the gospel anywhere the answer is no it's not safe I remember when we were in uh, Jakarta um, every Christmas and sometimes at Easter we, were, we had uh, razor wire all around the property where the church was we had piles of policemen there not doing very much I think but there, just before we got there there was a shrapnel bomb left in the car park at the church fortunately one of the security men found it but it would have killed many people uh, I remember my doctor asking me when we lived in Jakarta did you feel threatened I said, well, we were threatened all the time. We just had to be alert. We went to, I taught at the Anglican Institute in Bandung for a couple of years. Just a, I did a course on Anglicanism. But the little house they had, they had to be really quiet. And when they sang songs, they had to sing them quietly so that the neighbours didn't know because it was an area where churches were being destroyed, turned up, burnt down, and it was quite a hostile environment to be building uh, a training college. But that's around all the world, everywhere. That's the case, whether it's safe. Now, there are three groups in this story in Acts. Come back to Acts chapter 8. There are three groups that get scattered in what we're going to look at tonight. The first of them are the disciples, verse 4. Just a general term for all the disciples. They get scattered around. They go away. And what do they do? I want you to see what they do. Verse 4. They preached the word wherever they went. Now, they didn't give sermons. They just told the great announcement of Jesus. They gospeled the message, the good news, the great news of the Messiah. Now, this is, there are two remarkable things about this. One is that God lets them be scattered. Actually, that's not, really the, way, that's not the right way to say it, is it? God didn't let them be scattered. God scattered them, didn't he? Well, the Sanhedrin thought they were doing it, but this was God. God was behind this. That is remarkable, don't you think? And it's very unsafe. It's very scary that God might push his disciples out into places they hadn't been before. Is that right? The other remarkable thing is that when they get out there, they've actually got something to say. I think that's very interesting that they actually say something and they know what to say. Well, that's one group. That's a general group. But one of them, this is the second group, which is just one person, Philip. He goes down to a city in Samaria. The woman of Samaria lives somewhere around there. He, not necessarily where Philip went, but he goes there. In verse 5, what does he do? He proclaims the Messiah. 
He doesn't look for accommodation. He doesn't look to settle down. He doesn't look to start a business. He proclaims the Messiah. And verse 6, he performs signs, and people are astounded at the signs. But notice what it says. They paid careful attention, not to the signs, but to what he said. They paid careful attention to what he said. This is Philip. What did he say? Verse 12. He proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. He proclaimed King Jesus, ruling as God's king. Told them about Jesus. And they believed and were baptized. And then later on when he gets to talk to the Ethiopian, verse 35, what does he tell the Ethiopian? He preaches the gospel about Jesus. He tells him about Jesus as he's explaining Isaiah 35. Now the third group is Peter and John. Peter and John come down from Jerusalem to check out what's happening in Samaria. Because Samaria is kind of relatives of the Jews, but they don't like each other. They've got a mutual hostility. And so the apostles come down to see did the Samaritans really believe the gospel about Jesus? Now, why are they doing this? Well, they're doing it partly because, as I've said, there's this hostility. But it's also, you see, a crossing of the frontier. Is it possible that the gospel was meant to include the Samaritans? Is it possible that the Samaritans might be included in the purposes of God through Jesus? And the Spirit comes on the Samaritans when Peter and John the Apostles lay hands on them. Why does the Spirit wait for the Apostles to come? The reason, it seems to me, is the same as what I've just said, that this is a special group. Is it really possible that they will be included? And so we've got the two top Apostles, the Spirit comes on when they're there, the whole thing is in thought, authenticated as well as it could ever be. And so there should be no debate or dissension anymore in the future as to whether Samaritans are to be included in God's people. That's a topic for another talk. But on the way back, Peter and John, this is verse 25. On the way back, what do they do? Well, they go through all the villages and they proclaim the word of the Lord. They testify about Jesus. They preach the gospel. Well, so much for the persecution. Um, Saul is going around destroying the church, but the church is spread out all through Samaria so far, and lots and lots of people are turning to the Lord. Now, I've got some questions for us to think about here. When they went out, all these disciples, Philip and the others, what did they say? Now, we've already, I've already mentioned what they said. All the summary words more or less say the same thing. They they. They proclaimed the great news, the good news about Jesus. They, they testified about him being the king. They proclaimed the kingdom of God, God's kingly rule in the person of Jesus who died and was raised. They bring a message from the Lord. What they're doing is proclaiming what we would call the gospel. And I want us to use the word gospel. The gospel in the New Testament is the great message about Jesus, risen, ascended, glorified. But there's another question here, isn't there? How did they come to know what to say? How did, how did they know what the message was? How, did they, how could they get this right? Now, there are different answers for different groups of people. So the apostles, how did the apostles know what God's great message was? What is the answer to that? How did they find that out? Jesus told them, yes, there was a special, a special master class for two people who went to, on the road to Emmaus. Imagine, they said, their, what, was their ears burning or something? Some, something happened. Jesus explained it. Wouldn't you have liked to have been there? But then he goes back that night and he tells the whole disciples, he opens their minds to understand the scriptures and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them all the things concerning himself. Would you like to have been there? Well, if you'd have missed out, there was, a, there was a second class. And you can see this in Acts chapter 1. For 40 days, 40, 40 days, six weeks, 
six weeks, Jesus was teaching the disciples about the kingdom of God. So there's a whole bunch of them, not just the 12. All the disciples there, 120 assembled on the day of Pentecost, we're told. There for six weeks, Jesus is teaching them, teaching them, teaching them. Do you think they knew what to say after that? I think they did. Do you think they knew more than you do about what to say? I think they did. I think they did. They may not have known more than... Yes, well, some of us might know more than they did, but some of us, I don't think, do know that. We ought to know more. There's certainly more information available. There's a whole pile of letters and explanations that are written by Paul and Luke and others that they didn't have. Another question. Well, what about the disciples, though? There's thousands of people on the day of Pentecost. How did they get to know it? Well, you can see it. That the apostles taught them. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And when the big dispute about the widows came up in chapter 6, the apostles said, we're not going to deal with this. We need to devote ourselves to the ministry of the word and of prayer. And so they appointed these seven people, uh, one of whom got killed and one of whom went off as an evangelist. So I don't know what the widows how they fared anyway, but uh, that's what happened. They devoted themselves, they learnt from the, from the apostles. And later on, of course, um, for example, in chapter 11, we're going to look at some of this next week, when the gospel got to Antioch right up in the north, Barnabas was sent, and when he got there, the church continued to grow. There was a huge number of believers. He went and found Saul, who's now a Christian by this stage, and for a whole year... Barnabas and Saul taught the church. Would you have liked to have been there at Antioch for a year listening to Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas and Saul, I should say, teaching you about the gospel? Wouldn't that have been wonderful? Well, that's how they learned. That's how they knew what to say. But what was it, what is it that we might say? And how will we come to know what to say? One of the difficulties in the modern church is that the gospel has been so diluted and eroded and replaced that it's hard now to really have it clear in our mind. There's a whole range of human speak. Uh, God will help you to come to be the person you want to be kind of stuff, which is kind of true as far as it goes, but it doesn't go anywhere near where the gospel of Jesus goes. There's a kind of sentimental speak, which is that God loves you. Well, God does love you, but you want to say a bit more than that. What we need is the gospel that the apostles used, a gospel of Jesus speaks, talking about Jesus, Jesus the Lord of heaven and earth, the one who's made everything, who loves everything, who's come as the one who comes as the king to rescue his people, the one who's died and been raised, who saves by his death and resurrection, whose death demonstrates the enormous and deep love and compassion of God for people in his death and in his resurrection. A message that says, this Jesus is the one you should believe, trust your life to. He is the one that you ought to, ought to bring your repentance to and seek forgiveness. He's the one who will give you the spirit. He's the one you should follow and obey. That's the kind of thing that in the end we need to help people understand because that's God's message to everybody. But how will we know what to say? Now, some of us might know what to say already, but not all of us do. How will you find out? Well, you'll have to get taught. You'll have to learn. You could learn it in the scriptures, but you could learn it from other people. So that we can give an answer when people ask us questions, but more especially. We want to have our hearts filled and our minds filled with the Word and the Spirit of God. New battery. It wasn't me, it was the battery. Batteries recharged, yes. Minds recharged by the Spirit, by the Word. 
so that we are people like Paul in the end who was compelled by the love of Christ who knew that the love of God was poured into his heart every day by the Spirit who reminded him of the death of Jesus yes some might die for a good person for a righteous person some might even dare to die but God shows his love to us in this that while we were still sinners Christ died for us how do you get to say it you get to say it because your mind has it in you already you understand the message you get to say it because the spirit fills you and when will you get to say it well you get to say it when the spirit directs you to do it when the spirit gives you the opportunities and also when the spirit leads you to cooperate with others to do it together for some of us actually tonight we're going to do some more work on what is the message and how do we share it with people uh, there's a Trinity course over there Trinity Theological College runs courses for lay people I encourage you to go to them there's a really good one coming up uh, called the overview of the Bible it'll be like in a sense what Jesus taught the disciples beginning at Moses and take, showing us through all the scriptures all the things beginning with him to, to do with himself brothers and sisters I want to talk some more about this next week but today Acts chapter 8 shows you that God's great plan was to spread his disciples out they didn't plan it he did it but he gave them a message he taught them he would explained it to them they knew it they'd been changed by it he'd given them his spirit and the gospel went out into hostile territory amongst the Samaritans it continues past that of course the modern church outside of the Western world is growing people are being converted from Islam from Buddhism from Chinese religions from atheism from communism all around the world They're, it's happening because Christians are taking the gospel to their neighbors often in hostile circumstances often out of their own territory and the gospel is growing but it's growing with difficulty in the Western Church this is a very serious matter for us it is difficult but it's difficult everywhere and one day God will keep asking us and finally he'll ask us finally well what did you do what about all those people what about my glory what about my gospel let's pray father thank you that you have been gracious to us helping us to know you we pray that you'll continue to stir us up by your spirit fill our minds and hearts so that we too can be people who share the gospel and see many others come to know you and we pray it in Jesus name Amen